Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Wald as we are referencing our now reading through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to Song of Myself, passage number 51. In many ways, the farewell. Now, we've said already that these last cantos of Song of Myself are the uh, crescendo to the integral pedagogy that we were speaking of. And in some ways now, this is the call for a response. We're going to get some really strange language. Dude, Whitman loves to do this, where he literally speaks directly to you. Like, he'll ask, what do I feel like in your hands right now? And you kind of go, whoa, 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 what are you talking? And then, you, and then it hits you, oh yeah, I'm reading his poetry, which is kind of like he's there. He's going to speak directly to you. I think he learned some of this from his study of Shakespeare and his love of Shakespeare, especially. Do you remember what we call that in Shakespeare when the actor will speak, when Hamlet speaks directly to the audience a little more than kin and less than kind to be or not to be? That is the question. We call those soliloquies. And so in some ways, the voice of Whitman will become this soliloquy. Now, there are some people who say that this is some of the most beautiful poetry in all of Song of Myself. Now, the key line, as we've said from passage four, is both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. I witness and wait. There's a lot of wondering here, and you're going to hear it in the form of rhetorical questions, right? Now, Whitman loved his reading of the Gospels, and he had to have loved that moment when Jesus Christ looks around at all of his followers and says, I wonder if when I come back there will still be faith on the earth. That's the kind of question that we're going to get at the end. Will it be a happy question or a sad question? That's a fascinating way to think of it. Now at LearnStrong.net down the left hand side, Talks with Walt is what we're calling our playlist of these, uh, of these lectures. I've already given 24 lectures on the inscriptions poems. We've got 19 sections of starting from Pomenoc and of course Song of Myself from the intro lecture all the way through Passage 50. I hope that you've been with us. And if you have, and you've been following along and doing your own reading, and you have your own copy of the Deathbed Edition of Lisa Grass, you're editing and annotating that as we go, then you come to this set of lines, passage 51. The past and present wilt. I filled them, emptied them, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Listener up there, what have you to confide to me, look in my face while I snuff the sidle of evening. Talk honestly. No one else hears you, and I stay only a minute longer. Do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. I concentrate toward them that are nigh. I wait on the door slab. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? Will you speak before I am gone? Will you prove already too late? Now it's an interesting thing, and in a lot of, uh, in a lot of versions of the Deathbed Edition, these last lines come at the lower right corner of the page, and it's fascinating the number of readers who will then flip the page to see what he has to say next, and of course what he has to say next is passage 52, which is the very final lines of Song of Myself. Let's go through it now, and let's notice how what Whitman's trying to do now is to assume so much of what he's done from the very first word of the deathbed edition come to this moment and he will begin with time. The past and present wilt. It is interesting that he uses growth kinds of word pictures only now we're talking about a, a flower maybe that was beautiful and then it's wilting. It's dying. In other words, we've got a lot, some interesting dying imagery going on here. Uh, by the way, do notice that this conversation of the past and the present will take us ultimately to the future. So we've got all three of the potential tenses here, right? And as I've said, you guys, I really do believe the greatest poet of the 20th century was, of course, T.S. Eliot in Four Quartets was, a four, uh, was, of course, his greatest collection of poems. We've talked about this in detailed lectures. Remember what we said about Burt Norton? Time present and time past are both perhaps present and time future, and time future contained in time past. If all time is eternally present, all time is unredeemable, 
what might have been and what has been point to one end, which is always present. Hmm. Very interesting. I think that Eliot borrowed heavily from Whitman, and I think we can hear it here. The past and present wilt, notice, I have filled them, emptied them. In other words, now he's telling you what it is he's trying to do. He said, I tried to capture everything. Look, he says, he's, he says it this way, and proceed to fill my next fold of the future. Now this is amazing. Watch this. Of course, what have you been doing as you've been reading Leaves of Grass? Well, you've been flipping the pages. That is to say the leaves. That is to say the folds of the paper itself. I proceed. In other words, I'm moving forward to fill the next fold of the future, right? Now, we're going to hear a poem later that we'll discuss called Unfolded Out of the Folds from Autumn Riblets, the, the section. And when we get there, we're going to reference back to this uh, set of lines. By the way, notice this word emptied and filled, and notice how empty and filled have been used throughout Leaves of Grass to this point. You could do something quite fascinating after you finish a set of lines like this to go back and just say, you know what, I'm just going to sit, I'm going to read nonstop all of Leaves of Grass that I've, that I've worked through, and it's, it will be amazing the number of times that empty and filled will be, will be referenced one way or the other. And then he speaks directly to you. Watch this. Listener up there. Well, of course it makes sense. If you're holding the book in your hand or you've got it like you guys have it on your table right now and you're looking down into it, Whitman is looking back up at you. And so Whitman says, yo, you, up there. Listener, up there. Do you find it interesting that he says listener and not reader? You're a reader, right? I mean, you are a reader. But he, he calls you a listener. This is that voice. This is the song of myself. And the anticipation, of course, is that he wants you to be right there with him. By the way, put it in your notes at 3A. When we get to Brooklyn Ferry, crossing Brooklyn Ferry, passage 3, he, he, he's going to say that, I am here with you. And it's going to be kind of, it's going to be amazing that he does this, but he'll be calling on it from here. Listener up there. What have you to confide to me? In other words, here we are now at the end. By the way, in the 55 edition, it was listener up there. Hear you, dot, 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 what have you to confide to me? In other words, hey, do you have anything to say to me? In other words, reading as a dialogue, democracy as a dialogue. Whitman was thoroughly convinced that the multitudes that will be democracy only survive as a democracy if we learn how to listen to each other, how to talk, converse with each other. Notice he says, Look in my face. Now that's fascinating because by in passage 48, remember he said that when he looks in the faces of men and women, he sees God and in my own face in the glass. That is to say, look into my face. Become close with me. While I, and then it's a brilliant line, while I snuff the sidle of evening. Of course, the sidle is, you know, the uh, kind of sideways. In other words, we're moving into the evening time, the gloaming time, we might say, at the end of the day. Talk Honestly, by the way, in parentheses here in the deathbed edition, in the 55, no, no parentheses. Talk honestly. Let's be honest with each other. And then this amazing kind of aside, shh, no one else hears you. It's all right, it's all right. It's just you and me here. Whitman loves this idea that, hey, 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 it's just you and me. We're just having a little conversation so we can be honest with each other. And I say, and, and notice he says it, I stay only a minute longer. Well, we know, of course, that you've only got one more passage poem left, A Song of Myself. In other words, it's, it's the end of the day. It's the end of the poem. We're coming to the end of this. Now, Whitman is aware. Remember we said this about our study of the Declaration of Independence and great persuasive writing, that you have to consider the acrimonious audience. That is to say, you have to consider the audience that won't agree with you or will be upset at you. And so what do you have to do? concede a point. We want to go back to our lecture on, on Jefferson's Declaration of Independence to hear how he does that so brilliantly. Whitman's acutely aware of this. He also knew his Chaucer. Chaucer does the same thing, where he knows he's going to offend, so that he'll say something like this. Uh, do I contradict myself? In other words, okay, okay, if you've been with me, you know that there's a certain kind of bipolar tendency in my poetry. One schizophrenic tendency. One minute I say this, the next minute I say something completely, it's opposite. Now, of course, let's put it in our notes at 3A now. 
Whitman is channeling no question Ralph Waldo Emerson's most maybe famous essay, Self-Reliance. You'll remember that he says, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. Say what you want to say today, and then tomorrow speak something entirely different, even though it contradicts it. That is to say, the self is an evolving self. The democracy that is America is an evolving democracy. He says it very well then. I contradict myself. I'm large. I contain multitudes. I think this is one of the truths of Leaves of Grass that we have to reclaim in our postmodern America. As we are gutting each other over all of these silly political disputes and fights, America is a democracy and by definition a contradiction. The same man who wrote the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain animal rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that same man owned slaves right up until the day he died. Well, that's impossible. It's not impossible. It's contradictory. Those are two different things. And Whitman will point out time and again in Leaves of Grass, we got to be able to understand all of our contradictions because the human self is a contradiction in and of itself. Now, at the same time, he's always looking for that union, that harmony, that balance, as he was referencing it earlier in passage 50, right? He says, I'm large, I contain multitudes, and if you think about it, this is what Leaves of Grass has been to this point. The attempt to contain Everything. I mean, sometimes I'm asked, what is Leaves of Grass about? And my first instinct is to answer, oh, it's about everything. What do you mean it's about everything? Dude, it's about pretty much everything. I mean, by the time you get done with the very last poem of the Deathbed Editions, uh, we'll see if you can stay with us all the way, right? Uh, we're going to say, it is an amazing thing how this poem, this, he called it a poem, so I'll call it a poem. The entire Leaves of Grass, this book, contains, attempts to contain everything, multitudes, and then he says it. I concentrate toward them that are nigh. In other words, he's aware. It's only going to be certain readers that really get what I'm, what I'm about. Only a small handful. He's inviting you to become one of those readers, obviously. And then he says it. I wait on the door slab. Now we're going to read a line like that, and we're going to join it to the opening lines of Song of the Open Road, a foot and lighthearted. I take to the open road, healthy, free, the world before me, the long brown path before me leading wherever I choose. He says it, I'm ready to leave from the door slab will be the word picture, and let's go on a walk. Now, of course, this is the same walk that he's inviting us as students to take in passage 46, right? And then he asks some interesting rhetorical questions. He's been playing with these rhetorical questions all the way through Leaves of Grass, especially Song of Myself. Who has done his day's work? Who will soonest be through with his supper? Who wishes to walk with me? Again, the song of the open road immediately comes to mind. By the way, did you see the repetition of the three who's there? And then he asks the most intriguing of questions. Will you speak before I am gone? In other words, this might mean before you forget all the things that you've been challenged to consider in Leaves of Grass in Song of Myself. Will you prove already too late? It is a fascinating thing the way he uses the word test and prove. I think he learned it a lot in his study of Abraham Lincoln, especially that Gettysburg Address. That notion of the test, the proof, the examination. And notice he asks, will you prove already too late? In other words, is it possible that the ideas I'm sharing have passed you by? That you somehow can't understand them well enough? Remember that when our emancipator teacher pedagogue goes into the cave in Plato's Republic Book 7, he goes up to one of the youngest to emancipate one of the youngest. Notice in passage 46, 47, it's dear son. It's a child. It is, are you young enough to be able to appreciate what it is I'm trying to share with you, or have you already begun to wilt intellectually, to lose somehow your capacity to be young? What is it Wordsworth says, and my heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky? The child is father of the man. 
and I could wish my days to be, bound each to each by natural piety. Let's finish it 2A with messages here. Well, obviously, the beauty and the power and the dynamism of a democracy is contained in its multitudes of contradictions. This is a poem of contradictions. It will always remain a poem of contradictions, but what great art isn't a poem of contradictions? I mean, we'd say the same thing about Dante's Divine Comedy. We would definitely say the same thing about Milton's Paradise Lost. For sure we would say the same thing about Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid. Of course, I mean, think of it. As we said in our, in our detailed study of all of those texts, is, is the Iliad a, a, a poem glorifying war or talking about its horrors? Yes. Uh, wait, dude, you didn't give, the, you didn't give me one, an answer on either side of that. That's right, that's right. And of course, it is the great S. Scott Fitzgerald had said, it's the mark of true intelligence to be able to hold two diametrically opposed ideas at the same time in one's mind. That he labeled genius. Whitman would just call it simply democracy. That's what democracy, in fact, is. At 2B, well, we do have this intimate voice, don't we? He makes it very, very personal. As you're looking down, he's looking back up at you as a mirror. And, of course, Aristotle said great art is like a mirror that we're looking into and we see ourselves reflected back. At 3A, well, we mentioned, obviously, self-reliance. Thoreau's civil disobedience comes to mind as well. I want to talk, though, about um, Emily Dickinson and the way that Dickinson is able to achieve this kind of intimate voice as well. Um, this is my letter to the world that never wrote to me. Judge tenderly of me, she says in the final. Be nice, be nice to me. She has that ability to speak directly to the, you, the reader, as well. Well, finally at 3B, guys, we're coming to the end of the Song of Myself. How do you feel about the contradictions of America? Do you want to somehow imagine that they don't exist? Which seems to me pretty silly. Or can you embrace those contradictions and somehow still feel patriotic, as Whitman will feel? about America? Can you live with all the different multitudes that we contain? On to the last minute, as Whitman says, I don't have much time left. Let's go on and talk about barbaric yops. Thank you.